Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, I think it's just a, a short intro. You know, I'm, I'm Simon Tuddenham. I'm the uh, Chief of Product Success at Skyjet um, for UK and Europe. And uh, not surprisingly, therefore, you know, I'm based in the UK. Um, although, as you can see on this slide, um, over my time in product management roles, I've been lucky enough to work with many amazing organizations and fabulous teams across these countries. So it's a real pleasure to be able to share with you today some of my thoughts on the topic of product tooling and how by both recognizing and closing the gap, we can boost the productivity required to build a much stronger product function. Uh, it's a huge thank you from me to the team at Product School for helping to create this opportunity. Um, so, you know, without sort of further ado, I just want to dive straight in. I really like this slide because it's such a great representation for me of how fast product grew at a time in just one country. Now, when I saw this stat a number of years back, um, well, clearly, as you can see, two or three years back, it's just something that's never left me. Now, I've tried to find some updated numbers, um, but even chat can't help me with this one. Um, so imagine what these numbers must look like across the globe, let alone in Sweden in 2023. Uh, and I think, you know, that's just a real segue for me into an easy segue into the uh, the problem statement of today that I wanted to share with you some of my thoughts and and see um, hopefully through some of the chat or some follow up what uh, what your thoughts are. And uh, it'd be great to engage on that. Um, you know, we've grown so fast in product in such a handful of years. But as I've observed in a number of recent years, I'm not so sure tooling has necessarily kept up with us. Um, there's lots of things on offer out there, but let's just explore that a little bit further. So I want to introduce this problem to you around the, the gap in product tooling. You know, that's why I'm here today. Um, I was keen to take an opportunity to, to share a few of my thoughts on the product tooling landscape. Um, and they're based upon the fact that, you know, I've worked now in various product management roles um, over the last nearly 12 years, I think it must be now. Um, probably more, to be fair, because when I got started, it was, uh, you know, it was very new in the UK. And uh, and since then, uh, you know, the roles have just uh, moved on so fast, of course. And I think I was probably already in a product role before I was formally really ever in a product role. So it was around 2011 when I, I first got my uh, teeth into my first product role, um, becoming one of the first product owners at a, a major UK supermarket brand. Um, I had no idea what it really meant. Um, I had very, you know, I was very much looking forward to a fresh challenge. Um, I'd been operating in a business analysis role, and I just didn't feel as if I was getting much in the way of momentum or enjoyment from that. Uh, but here was an opportunity to do something completely different. Uh, the whole point of that introduction to the product, you know, is that it meant I was immediately sort of thrown in at the deep end. Um, and, you know, I would now frame around what was really execution based in terms of the tooling that we were using and probably certainly as we'll explore a little bit deeper here many of us are still using to this day um yeah everything that we were doing was was all about you know, forming and managing that backlog and then that kind of eat sleep repeat process and focus of, of getting stuff moved and shipped yeah, I don't really remember that many conversations about value creation or customer insight or what the key results should be that we were targeting. And, uh, you know, it was still nevertheless, though, a new lease of life. And, and it was the start of a wonderful journey through many varied product roles that I've been lucky enough, um, as I said in the introduction, to, uh, to have over that time. Um, so as these roles matured more into leadership positions in, in recent years, of course, your focus changes. Um, the lens through which I've been looking at product teams in recent years moved much more from the near to the far, um, a more umbrella sort of aspect view across teams um, and thinking more strategically about, you know, what it was the sort of end to end perspective of what that team needed. But what I came to realize was that whilst there are, of course, a huge number of, of different tools and toolkits out there that help the, the product role to um, to be successful, um, I just didn't see um, enough of that kind of support from um, organizations. Um, you know, there's plenty of support for tools that would increase or perhaps measure our output. Yet when it came to that enhancement and step change for the product team specifically, 
but this wasn't a great deal of appetite for that investment. And then, you know, at least not unless it boosted output again, you know, or made delivery dates more clear, um, or just created more general visibility. Uh, and you know, that sort of helps to frame the problem state for me that we, you know, we need to help ourselves more. You know, we need to help our teams and to help our organizations to understand that there is now a much better way forward and that there is a gap. Uh, and it's not just for product teams, but it's for the overall organization to be much more product framed and product led in its mindset. You know, I'm going to just take us through um, a number of slides here, which are just a, a journey to paint some of that picture and, and some of the potential wins that we can target and better outcomes that we can target to the end. For me, it's quite simple. You know, in many of my re recent conversations across the network, um, particularly since I moved into a new role and those kind of conversations are much more prevalent in what I'm doing right now, um, there's a pervading theme. Uh, at least eight, maybe out of 10 of those conversations lead back to some kind of statement from um, whoever it is in whatever product roles that suggests for all of that best will in the world, that most of the product managers, the product teams are, are drawn back to base and back to their feature factory. You know, I've lived this myself and arguably far too often. Uh, the, you know, there's a great deal to do to craft an environment and a culture that pivots us away from this kind of approach you know, and embraces those opportunities that I think we all hear so much of and we crave about value and about outcome. Product tooling can be a significant driver for that um, and can underpin a difference in ways of working and thinking. Not only can it do this, you know, create the potential to um, unlock in teams that they can be much more value um, focused and value centric in the way they work. It can also be a beacon for change for a lot of the other functions around us who might typically drive us much more towards the, the feature factory mindset. So product tooling can help us to focus on those right outcomes and it can apply the brakes to a more output centric measure of success. But you know, I mentioned earlier about how product is has really grown so fast. But you know, have product tools kept pace with that growth? Um, I think we've all got a great appreciation, I'm sure, from all of the material we read and the conferences we attend, etc., of just how much product management has grown over the last five to ten years, and and continues to grow, and that there's so much great content out there. And, you know, as we attend more of these sessions in person or online, the messages that are all related to best practice, to goals, to skill sets, they continue to enthuse. You know, we'll go to all these conferences and everybody's absolutely buzzing with the wonderful talks and presentations and content. Um, and they demonstrate the pace at which the product space is really pushing ahead. However, as this picture seeks to outline, um, you know, product tooling becomes a bit of a, a back marker potentially and struggling to keep up with the pace which is being set at the front. Therefore, is that sort of inadvertently beginning to hold us back, um, not least from just some of the points I've already made? Now, we've seen such a significant growth in product roadmap tooling over recent years, but that in itself can't provide all the answers to everything a product manager really needs. Uh, there are many other tools that also you know, contribute to that overall growth journey, but are they all really ticking the boxes that a product manager wants and, and needs and is looking for? I'm not altogether convinced they are. So you know, I've written a few blogs um, in SkyJet recently about how, um, and one in particular about how product catalogs can become sort of lost to a very different intent and become absorbed by tooling with other priorities. You know, it's clear to me we need a step changing tooling that supports the core of what product managers are all about and about what we need. And that embraces the product's journey through their own life cycle of those products, rather than being something to continue to just add more and more through that feature factory um, to the product. So as I just alluded to, you know, are, are product teams being held back as a result? Because if we're frequently being drawn back into being a feature factory and with a toolkit that's supporting our desire, you know, isn't, I should say, supporting our desired growth, you know, is it fair to suggest that it's holding us back a little? 
Now, I can draw upon enough experiences, as I'm sure you can, of seeking to drive investment in toolkits to support our growth specifically as a product function. However, when that sort of push comes to shove moment, the appetite and the budget is, is rarely, in my experience, made available for it. You know, hopefully that's beginning to change and, uh, and hopefully you're seeing it change. But certainly in my experience, um, there have been some, some deflating moments a little bit where that hasn't been able to, uh, to really get the momentum it could. As you get more and more uptake of the role of CPO, uh, and as that becomes more widely adopted, then you know, perhaps that voice will become louder and the presence stronger and therefore the decision making, the budget holding, uh, moving more directly into the product space. Um, I don't think I've seen enough of this just yet. Uh, maybe that's uh, a regional thing. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, maybe we see more of that in, in certain regions than others. Um, you know, and I look forward more to seeing organizations create those environments where that kind of thinking can really thrive. So in the meantime, if we're not invested and supported in this manner, you know, it's inevitable we'll simply be drawn back by default into that world of output and with the tools that are there to underpin that. And it, it, it often feels like that sort of whirlpool effect and sort of drawing us back into it. So sort of finishing off this little bit of a section, you know, in summary, it, it feels to me like being like the horse with the blinkers on. By applying the blinkers to product teams, uh, our vision and opportunity gets narrowed. Yeah, it achieves the goal of keeping us focused on shipping and delivering more, but what's the cost? Yeah, uh, I'm going to move on to, to some of the impact areas a little bit later, but for now, I'd just ask you know, that we ask ourselves if this is or if this has been happening in your environments that you work in. You know, can you recognize this? Then if you do, then you know, you know, what could you do differently to seek a much better outcome? So what's the impact of seeing a gap in tooling for product teams? Um, you know, I think to affect any form of change, we've got to first recognize that that problem exists. And I you know, hope that what you've heard so far does help to support that. And if you can relate to it in your own experiences, then you know, let's take a little bit of a deeper look into what some of that impact is. So I think first and foremost, you know, I challenge us all to say that we've worked somewhere where this question never appeared. What is product and what does it do? Um, it's been a constant theme during my time in product. Not only are we hearing and reading so much about product, so are our colleagues from different functional areas. And, and you'd think that would help to smooth the path to a much better outcome, but why doesn't it always seem to do that? Yeah, my, my take on that is that by having a gap in product tooling, we're, we're sort of fueling the viewpoints with a different agenda. Um, you know, typically this agenda, as I keep saying, is about output. And it's about the need for more and not so much about how sometimes you know, less is more. If the tooling that we used um, is measuring output and velocity and throughput, et cetera, then it's keeping us away from more value based measures of success. And, you know, I've watched teams get consumed by that. Um, and as great as those measures are in a place that they have not necessarily really help the product team to grow and to thrive. So for me, what it does is it, it, it further adds and fuels a more fragmented tooling landscape. So when I talk to product managers about how they track the value that they create, and often it's all too rare, they're, then they're reliant upon the other people and departments, and as a result on other tools or other data sources, and that creates that fragmentation. So by not having a centralized or single source of truth, for your view across all of your products and their product lifecycle, then we, we fragment into a world of disparate tools and sources. And inevitably that just becomes too hard to maintain and manage. That means everyone, again, gets withdrawn back into um, the, the easier spaces, the easier worlds where those kind of tools are, uh, are in play. And you know, the overarching result is that strong appreciation of what product management is all about just becomes much harder to achieve. So often there's neither the time nor the inclination to do so. And that tooling gap for me, as I continue to observe, is only fueling that fire further. I think you know, one of the things which has really uh, been a great part of my journey in recent years is the opportunity to get so close to such talented people in product. 
Um, and arguably, this is the single biggest impact area. You know, I've hired so many talented product people um, over the years, and particularly in recent years. Um, but I've gradually watched many deflate by the environments created around them, which are just not giving them exactly what it is that they were hoping for and looking for. So culture and environment is everything. And, and creating a space where you can continuously learn and develop, and most importantly, then put that into practice. But, you know, and so you seek to do this and you know, we've been able to attract great talent, of course, but however, retaining that talent has become much harder. Our market is filled up with a plethora of amazingly talented and ambitious product people, and they deserve an environment to thrive in. And part of that environment is about toolkits. So organizational cultures are a, a key contributor sometimes to holding them back. And, you know, an appetite for change that sometimes rarely materializes. And, and that can, again, as I've said two or three times now, it can help to, to help us revert to type. So if your environment and culture change has been successful, you know, I'd hope you can see how this does unlock sort of greater retention and that you um, you don't have a huge amount of, of attrition in your teams. And, you know, eventually the direction shift going back to delivery and output in some of my experience and the, the team does then begin to deflate. And what happens? The attrition rates rise uh, and the evidence is there for all to see. They're facts. They're things you can't deny. And there are always underlying reasons and uh, and drivers for why that's happened. So basically, in summary, you know, you'll lose your talent unless you properly invest in what it is that they want and what it is that they need. And tooling is very much part of that landscape. I mentioned about defaulting back to tools with the same old focus. So by not seeing and embracing the tool sets which are emerging for product managers, the pathway becomes that very simple default back to all of those usual tools with their as-is focal points. My own experiences, as I've mentioned far too often, um, have come down this pathway. You know, at the core of, of product development, we find all the tools we're used to having around us for a considerable amount of time now, and these tools typically and often promote an agenda of delivery and service. Um, and they lead us back into that sort of narrow, blinkered, output-focused environment. You know, the worst part of this for me is, is that it defaults us back into that same old thinking. It becomes almost too like pushing water uphill. It's too hard to, to push against. So as a result, we're effectively stifling an opportunity for growth for product managers and for teams as, as a whole. Um, and, you know, I personally find that such a shame. Uh, it's it's a key part of the reason why I chose to focus on helping to evangelize this message now through what I, I've chosen to do um, with my career at the moment. And, you know, and that's about the need to invest in product teams and to listen to what it is that they're looking for. Give them those toolkits, allow them to, um, to trial and, and learn and grow and develop those toolkits that will give a greater effectiveness and presence to the product role. I think that's ultimately where it's all about. It's you know a different level of effectiveness for product teams. Now, I'm very passionate about this now, as hopefully you can pick up on. And you know, I've watched the energy spill from product teams who feel like they're absolutely truly able to make a difference in what they do, where they've got that investment, that empowerment, and all of that motivation. You know, who wouldn't want to do that? And part of the, that landscape for them to be able to grow is to do so with a basis of fantastic tooling to help them. So, you know, following on from that last message, this is really about opportunity. So in this area, this sort of segment of a few slides, I've talked about awareness, about deflation, about defaulting back to the as is. And the underlying driving factor is about that output focus and one which really impacts product teams so significantly. Um, and where, you know, one key impact is in that tooling position. So when you're advocating something different, it's not it's not often only is it really you know a hard slog to prepare and articulate your message. It's also so time consuming that I feel some of the impetus can be lost. So, you know that's such a shame, and I you know I have enough experience of it that I thought, you know, what could I share with you that would help to clear the path for you? Well, for me, it's pretty much down to being able to invest the right amount of time in your product strategy. 
And I don't just mean the strategy for your products, but the strategy specifically for your product function and how that is to move forward and how that's going to grow. So, you know, too often we look at these objectives as something of a side initiative. And that means a small percentage of time is going into it. The day job will always be there to haul you back. So to make it happen, define some roles which are specifically aligned to this and hire or second into these positions for a period of time. You know, you'll you'll meet some challenge and pushback from others of, of seeing the value in those activities, perhaps. But remain firm, remain focused, and the value is absolutely there in helping for you to drive more towards a product-led organization that in the way that everyone thinks and operates. It, it's it's across everybody here, but it's upon us in product to to help to promote something which is which is new. Because old habits and practices take some breaking. So if you're going to find a silver bullet, um, and I'd say tooling is right up there in the silver bullet list, it, you know, this can tangibly demonstrate the impact of me being more product led in the mindset and the actions that happen across the entire organization. And um, what kind of challenges does this create as a result for us? Well, um, I've mentioned earlier about the deflation in product teams and the attrition it creates. Um, as an example to build upon, you know, I once worked in a space where we tried really hard to promote a different understanding as to what product was and is. Um, we sought and endeavored to build a culture underpinned by learning and development, by freedom for talented product managers to express their abilities. And as a result, attrition was the smallest across the entire department. However, over time, this, this just couldn't be sustained. And we were always being hauled back into the promises of output and delivery mindset, dates, costs, et cetera. And, and this began to outweigh the sort of true reason for our purpose. So the creation of, of consumer and organizational value diminished. Um, you know, as this happened, I noticed the attrition rates begin to rise. And, and this shouts loud for me for the right environments and cultures and having the right tooling um, in place to demonstrate the intent of the overall organization to invest in the product space. And that should be, as I keep saying, considered a key contributory factor to some of the attrition you get. So invest in your product tooling and teams or someone else will attract your talent into an environment that has what you don't have. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier about how soon and how much is the usual sort of return to size everything, cost everything and make a promise around everything. I've observed plenty of product managers who have no problem with this and solidify their own positions with it as almost their own operating model. For me, they're not the product managers of today, of 2023 and beyond. And it's something to be aware of and make sure you have a plan to address. Tooling again um, and everything that goes with it, it's something of a barometer for me as to how you're shaping up as a team. If you have a team who's seen and embrace that opportunity, you'll be less focused on cost and date and more about creation and measurement of value. So if you can select tooling that will both simplify and power that strategy, you know, don't make it feel like an overhead or an unnecessary use of time. If you do, I promise you, you're on the verge of falling back into those old ways of thinking and operating. So allow the tooling to be your, your magic wand, your bag of you know, magic gold dust, whatever it is. Um, but it's something which can really light up that journey for you. Uh, one of the great and sort of simplest um, opportunities that comes with tooling focused upon product is making sure you become the first to know about any issues and opportunities. So if you set your toolkits up to trigger and inform you when something is degrading or improving, well, that's placing product front and center. It demonstrates that you have your finger on the pulse and that, and, you know, and it will diminish that sort of reactivity approach all the time. Um, you know, too often I felt often like I was the last to know or our teams were the last to know. So by the time the issue reached me, it had been through so many hands, inboxes, conversations, and then my role was pretty much expected to just fix it or deliver a solution that some others had already decided. That's not allowing me, in my opinion, to be the best product manager I can be. Um, and I completely think that it's limiting my ability and the team's ability to make the right recommendations and the right decisions about the journey for the product. So if your toolkits are highlighting risks and issues for you, that's great. Better that you know first. And in addition, if they're also highlighting areas of growth, then you've got a great opportunity to make decisions and divert resources to further improve those growth areas. 
you know, the agility in that is really empowering and engaging. And rather than just keeping on shipping the next thing and reacting to fix the next issue, now you have the ability to make decisions and pivot and embrace those growth opportunities. This is where it's at in the product space. So don't you know over-engineer it, simplify it and make it effective with the right toolkits that you need in, in your product space. So I'm going to wrap up and um, just go through a couple more slides to, to finish off and think about what, what the wins could be. What do great outcomes potentially look like? Well, you know, I can't deny that this statement, we've all heard it many times before, has been at the forefront of a lot of my leadership message in recent years. You know, don't get me wrong. There are projects. There will always be projects. They won't go away. But if we allow projects to be the only or the main show in town, we'll again lock ourselves back into a time and cost conversation. Scope and requirements will be the driving force. And without fail, everyone loves to have their say when it comes to scope. Yeah, it, it is sort of effectively gives everyone an opportunity to wear a product hat and reduces the effectiveness, I think, from what I've seen of those actually in product roles in the teams. I've said, you know, for many years now, we're a product team. We build products which have a life and we focus less upon delivering products that are all about just the cost and the time the, or the projects, if you like. Easy to say, pretty tough to execute. So product tooling can help us again. You know, I've mentioned that's all the, the whys and the impacts earlier on about this, but the clue is in the title. It's a product management toolkit, not a product, man uh, a product management tool and or a project management tool, I should say. So embrace it for what it stands for and for the opportunities it creates to power up your people, your practices, your teams, and ultimately then to allow you to just continue to build better and better products. So grasp this opportunity with both hands, allow tooling to be the vehicle which triggers and supports it. You know, too often we get trapped in the near, everything that's happening now, um, uh, you know, the, the opportunities are the ones that are more proactively highlighted by your tooling, so they can allow us to ideate, to innovate, and to think more into the future, into the middle and the far. And this, it, the point here is that this, that the opportunity doesn't have to just be in the changes you can make in your next iteration. It could be a pivot in your focus. You could be, you know, rewiring the medium or even the longer term roadmap. You've got your finger on the pulse, and that's powered by tooling that you can look at every minute of every day and is helping you um, as you refine it to. Um, you know, quickly identify and make quick decisions. Overall, I mean, I could do a full session, I think, on um, on the simplification of the tooling landscape. Now, I was at an event recently where a lot of the attendees were, were chatting about returning to old tools when they go back to the day job. Um, and But a few talked about a situation where they had too many tools and often those tools were selected by other functions. So as a result, they were struggling to understand the intent of what their now overall tooling landscape looked like. Um, they weren't sure really where they should be placing a lot of focus on in their time. So the learning for me is that via maybe more integrations, more consolidations, we could significantly simplify the tooling landscape. And with key product management toolkits at the center of this experience, they sort of become the centerpiece of the onion, if you like. So finally, and, you know, I just want to return to the point I referenced earlier. We have the opportunity to enhance the product role um, and the role that we should be playing in organizations. Um, using toolkits specifically designed for product and teams has the ability not just to answer the many challenges I outlined earlier, can fundamentally raise the bar for the role of product and ensure that others more readily understand you know, what we are here to do and indeed what we're not here to do, because I think sometimes that is, is too often missed. I'm a firm believer in it's all about the team and everyone targeting common goals. But in product, we can't wear every hat and everyone else shouldn't try to wear our product hat. Um, I'm sure you get that intent. There are boundaries in roles that help to make our teams much more effective. You know, when I was very much immersed in those roles, um, I saw how well this worked. We were a tight team. We solved everything together. We all had our input um, and we definitely benefited from knowing the boundaries though between our roles. Tooling, again, can help us to define this. And in the space I'm now working, I really value that product managers can give complete visibility via the tooling to all their um, all the other roles and all the users without feeling like their work across the product lifecycle is, is being overly compromised by, per se, too many fingers in the pie. So, you know, these tools are out there to benefit us. Um, and it's really a great opportunity for us to get out there and to embrace them. 
So they're my thoughts for today. Um, it's amazing how fast the time absolutely flies by. Thank you for taking the opportunity to to listen to some of my thoughts around the product tooling landscape and and the difference that it can make and some of the things we need to watch out for. A um, little slide at the end here just to say um, who I am again and to, to open up that. If you'd like to get in touch, please do. It would be a pleasure to further the conversation with you and learn about some of the the challenges and the opportunities that you're facing when it comes to your product tooling landscape. All the very best. Good luck.